Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome. I have a few minutes before 6.30, and a lot of people still trying to join on, so we'll just hang on. But I'd like to get it started at 6.30. Hi, Catherine. Hi, David. Good to see you. Welcome on board. Well, good evening, everybody. And I have 6.30 on my computer and I wanna welcome you to a joint collaborative evening program with the Prairie Winds Garden Club and myself with the University of Wyoming Extension Office. Our guest speaker tonight is Dr. David Lewis. He has become my go-to person for a tremendous amount of things. He started beekeeping back in 2014 and has embraced it wholeheartedly with a lot of enthusiasm right down to planting pollinator habitats. And he has become quite well versed with what kind of flowers the native bees like and will go to. He has put blends together and he buys wildflower seeds in bulk from Applewood Seed and then at his, um, the call, whatever it costs him, he turns around and sells it to people who want to plant wildflower pollinator habitats. So with that to do, I'm going to turn the program over to David Lewis. Yes, good evening, everybody. This is actually, I think, the second program that Prairie uh, Garden Club has had on planting uh, for pollinators because Catherine gave us a talk a little more than a year ago when we were still meeting face to face and uh, covered quite a lot of the territory for uh, establishing a um, pollinator habitat. So I thought tonight I'd do something just a little bit uh, different and I'm going to try to make this a little more interactive than the usual Zoom talk. Uh, what I have is a challenge to you to see if you recognize some of the uh, native and even some non-native plants that are particularly attractive to both honeybees and also to other pollinators, including bumblebees, native bees, and moths and butterflies and even hummingbirds. And so I will be showing some pictures and uh, seeing if you want to try and guess uh, the plants that I'm showing. And I know some of you are going to know all, all of them because I know some of uh, the folks in the club are more knowledgeable about native plants than I am. I only got into this because I was interested in doing plantings after I started keeping uh, honeybees. And honeybees are actually an introduced uh, species. They are not native to North America. I guess there are some fossil honeybees from quite a long time ago in Arizona, but uh, there have not been uh, honeybees here in the Americas until they were brought over from, from Europe at the same time that the Europeans colonized uh, the United States. So all the bees, all honeybees that we have, whether they are in our hives or feral bees that are living in the wild, are descendants of those bees that were brought over. Um, this is a little different from our native bee and native pollinator populations, which have been, uh, which have grown up in our ecology for thousands and tens of thousands of years. 
and have basically uh, adjusted to and co-evolved with uh, the plants. So native plants are very attractive to native pollinators. And in many cases, they're attractive to honeybees as well. Honeybees are perfectly happy with some plants that you probably would not want in your prairie meadow. Uh, they can get along fine on uh, Canada thistle or uh, yellow Dutch clover, which is considered an invasive in, in some areas um, because they themselves are not native, native bees. Um, so fortunately, if we plant certain kinds of plants, we can support both the introduced honeybees and, and the native pollinators. Let me see if I can bring my slides up here. Let's try this. And let's see, I want to share my screen. And we'll go for this one. Okay. Ah, here we are. Okay, let's see. Can everybody see that? Catherine, is that working? Okay. Yeah, it looks Okay, it, great. It looks fine, yeah. So about a year ago or a little more, Leah was asking for suggestions for possible uh, talks. And my suggestion was that we have a session. That was when we were meeting face to face called, I don't remember planting this. <laughs> and my idea was that we could bring in plants that came up in our gardens or our yards, or at least bring in a photo of them and show them to some of the other members and see if we could figure out what they were because I had any number of things growing in my yard and I had no idea what they were. Um, I have about three and a half acres kind of northwest of town and uh, we did have wildflowers growing there, but I would say they were socially distanced. There were about six feet or so between blooms. Um, so there wasn't a whole lot of forage for my honeybees there. And I became interested in trying to uh, come up with a seed mix that I could plant that would uh, support my bees. And if I support some of the native pollinators, that's fine too. Um, the other possible topics for a talk would be, I've never seen that plant before, or maybe I have seen the plant before, but I'm still not sure what it is. Now, some of you I know have already been growing any of these native, uh, native plants, and maybe you've had good success with them. So I hope if that's the case, as I show these slides, uh, you'll weigh in, uh, you raise your hand or unmute or come into the chat box. If you've had particular luck in growing these, if you've got some hints for us about uh, how to uh, get the seed to germinate and any sort of cultivation of, of plants and you've had success in your garden, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, theory is great, but uh, practice is even better. And I know some of you have been growing on these, these plants uh, in your gardens or in your yards uh, probably quite a bit longer than I have. So why do we, now let's see, this is, I'm mixing myself up here. I want to go back to, okay, let's see. Uh, I lost my presentation here, but let's find it again. There we go. So why should you plant plants to support pollinators? Some people say, well, I'd like to help save the honeybee. And I'm really happy when people in my neighborhood uh, plant pollen and nectar plants because my bees will be happy. But I have to admit that honeybees in America are not an endangered species. It is challenging to keep honeybees alive. There are lots of difficulties and that includes diseases and parasites and the presence of pesticides and herbicides and even the changing climate uh, can all have an impact on honeybees. But there are well over a million colonies of honeybees that people are keeping uh, in the US, not to count the ones that have escaped and taken up residence in the wild. Um, and every year in the spring, folks breed more bees and they raise more queens. So um, although keeping honeybees is challenging, we can't really claim that the honeybees are endangered at this point. But the native pollinators in many cases are. Uh, the numbers of native insects uh, worldwide essentially have been declining for a couple of decades. There's a little test that people proposed, which was the windshield test. And they said that you could remember uh, back when I was a boy, 
if you drove across the Midwest, <clears throat> you probably had to stop every 100 miles or so and pull into a gas station where an attendant in a white jacket would come out and pump your gas and also wash off your windshield. Because after 100 miles or so, your windshield would be covered with bugs. Well, unfortunately, nowadays, you could drive for maybe 1,400 miles across the Midwest without having to clean your windshield once. And that is a unscientific sample of the number of native insects that are in the air um, during the time that you're driving. Uh, more scientific polls have showed declines in the populations of insects in Europe and in America. And about two thirds of the produce that we put on our plates depends on insects for pollination. The other third can be pollinated by wind pollination. In China, they now hire young women with paintbrushes to pollinate apple blossoms because there are not enough native pollinators to uh, supply the, the pollination needs for orchards. Uh, there are, uh, they're working on a robot honeybee the size of about a quarter at Yale. Uh, they've managed to get it to take off and land, but they haven't trained it yet how to find flowers and, and spread pollen. And there are also services that now use drone aircraft and they collect pollen in one season, store it over the winter, and then distribute it by air to make up for the, the uh, lack of, of pollinators in their areas. Seems to me it would be less expensive and probably uh, fundamentally better to just not allow our native pollinators to decline to the point where we have to substitute other pollination methods to keep things going. Uh, some of the reasons that the native pollinators are declining are the use of pesticides and herbicides, but also particularly loss of habitat. There just aren't as many uh, parts of our land that are left wild to grow uh, native plants as we used to have. And that also means a loss of forage. A and climate change is also changing the range for uh, many of our native insects. Now, even if you're not interested in bugs, native plants often make wonderful additions to the garden. These are colorful flowers. They're very well adapted to our soil and climate, so they grow well. They're tough, they're hardy, they don't require a lot of water. So you don't have to uh, be interested in, in saving insects in order to enjoy some of the uh, plants that I'm gonna be showing to you, that's a, that's a bonus. Uh, when we think about planting for pollinators, we're looking at plants that produce nectar and pollen. And in particular, the bees and native bees are fond of uh, plants that produce very sugary nectar. They really like it to be greater than 50% sugar, but they're happy if it's up, upwards of about 30%. And in the pollen, uh, we look for high protein content, but also we look for a balance of amino acids. And we look for plants that produce abundant quantities of nectar and pollen. Some plants have not only flowers, but they also produce nectar in extra floral structures uh, which can also be attractive to uh, bees and other pollinators. In many cases for the native pollinators, we're interested in native plants, and that's because they co-evolved with those insects and the insects are uh, well adapted to use them. Um, they're also adapted to uh, Wyoming soil and climate and the amount of moisture that we have. Uh, we're not only supporting insects with nectar and pollen, but in some cases, the plant itself is a host plant for caterpillars, for moths and butterflies. And in some cases, the plants provide nesting material. For example, the hollow stalks might provide uh, nesting sites for solitary bees that look for a hollow cavity uh, to make a solitary nest. I'm gonna give you a few resources. Some of you, I think from last year, already have the uh, guide promoting pollinators on your place which is a terrific uh, resource with lots of information about Wyoming plants and uh, planting for pollinators. Uh, Catherine handed those out, but if you didn't get one, you can uh, get it online as a download. Uh, another one that I've been using is 100 Plants to Feed the Bees, which was put out by the Xerxes Society, which is a group that supports uh, native pollinators. Uh, USDA has a list of plants for pollinators. Wikipedia has uh, reprinted the uh, North American nectar sources for honeybees, and that can also be found in some of the beekeeping manuals. 
And then there's uh, your tax dollar at work. Uh, the uh, Department of Defense, under a presidential uh, directive, has been attempting to support uh, pollinators on military lands. And so they hired a botanist and biologist and asked them to come up with plant lists and planting suggestions for all the areas in which the military holds lands. There are, I think, 11 or 13 uh, in the Wyoming, Colorado area. And so they have uh, looked at these, uh, the climate, looked at the soil and made suggestions uh, for using native species to support pollinators. So uh, these are very focused and very, it's a very handy resource uh, for uh, our area. Now, if you want to plant uh, a bed of wildflowers or an acre or two of uh, a prairie meadow in support of pollinators, probably the single most important thing you can do is to try and prepare the soil ahead of time. These plants are tough. They can survive uh, harsh winters. They can survive droughts, but they don't do terribly well in competition with some of the aggressive introduced species, particularly uh, grasses, which have been brought in because they spread very uh, aggressively. And uh, to someone planting a grass pasture, wildflowers are weeds. And they would like their uh, pasture plants to be able to successfully compete and overcome the weeds. When we're trying to plant the weeds as wildflowers, because we want a pollinator habitat, we need to try to minimize the amount of competition that they will have with some of these rather aggressive and perhaps non-native uh, species. So clearing the ground, not only of the vegetation that is there to begin with, but also to exhaust the seed bank that is hidden in the soil is very important. Our wildflowers are, are going to be able to survive and thrive. And this may take a full season before, uh, of simply uh, soil preparation before you can plant your seed. Now, if you're planting a bed in your garden, uh, it's a good deal easier to clear that out and to, to keep it weeded than if you're planting a large, large meadow. Um, some of the ways to try to exhaust the seed bank that is in the soil is to repeatedly till the soil. So uh, till it under, allow the seeds that are exposed by the tilling to sprout, till it again, allow the seeds to sprout, till it again, and do that perhaps for a full growing season before uh, planting the wildflowers in the fall. Uh, it's possible to burn the vegetation. Uh, of course, that um, requires permits and, and a good deal of care, but uh, when trying to plant a fairly substantial area and restore it to uh, prairie ecology, that's an opportunity. Uh, you can, if this fits in with your gardening philosophy, use herbicides like uh, Roundup uh, glyphosate uh, and then uh, allow them to uh, decay out of the soil before uh, planting wildflower seeds. Or you can plant a cover crop uh, such as annual rye and uh, till it under before it goes to seed and use that to some extent to choke out uh, the undesired uh, plants before you prepare the bed to, to sow your wildflowers. Um, Xerxes says that they are using solarization, which is essentially putting plastic, uh, greenhouse plastic uh, over the soil and allowing the sun to uh, bake the vegetation and the seeds that are buried in the soil and to essentially sterilize the soil in that way. Um, and uh, then after uh, solarizing the soil for a season or so, they can plant seed the new wildflowers into that clean, uh, clean soil. Many wildflowers respond to cold, moist stratification, which simply means that the seed has evolved so that it needs to freeze and thaw several times before it will successfully germinate. And uh, there are several ways to achieve that. One of them is simply planting your wildflowers in the fall so that the seed will overwinter and will undergo successive freezing and thawing as a natural uh, process. If you'd like to keep track of your seed though, you can do that in a book jug. I think we've had a couple of talks about overwintering or wintering seed in, in milk jugs, which allows for 
uh, this, this cold moist stratification. You can also do it in the uh, refrigerator and freezer, um, simply uh, planting the seed into a, a moist but not wet uh, planting medium and shifting it from the freezer to the refrigerator every day or two for a week or two will provide that alternating freezing and thawing um, that will improve uh, germination. Now, not all of the uh, pollinator wildflowers require this, but many do. Um, and that's why many folks will try and plant their um, wildflower beds in the fall and then keep an eye on them for the coming spring when they're likely to get pretty good germination. Um, many of the desirable pollinator plants are perennials and they may not bloom the first year. Um, they may spend their first year uh, sending down fairly deep root systems. Many of these plants have deep tap roots, which allows them to uh, survive uh, drought conditions um, that plants that are less deeply rooted would not be able to tolerate. Um, so the first year, many of these seeds may be predominantly rooting and not showing so much growth on top of the soil. Well, that's actually uh, a handy thing because it makes it possible uh, to do some successive mowing the first year and even into the second year. Now, normally you do not want to mow your, your permanent prairie meadow. <clears throat> the uh, plants in the, in the fall and into the winter help to hold the snow on and that conserves moisture. Uh, but when getting established, sometimes um, mowing can be a very useful way to help to keep uh, down the uh, non-perennial and undesirable plants and give your perennial plants a chance to, uh, to root and grow. Um, <clears throat> so seeding, uh, many of these seeds enjoy close contact with the soil. So it's recommended that you compress uh, the soil with a, a roller, a garden roller, or by uh, walking across the, uh, the seed bed to compress the seeds into the soil. Uh, mulching uh, the seeds also helps to keep down the undesirable uh, weeds and let your wildflowers uh, get a head start. And they may require water. Eventually, they will not require uh, extra water. Many of these plants will do fine on our rainfall. Uh, but when getting established, they may need even daily watering for six to eight weeks. You can plant a nurse crop of ryegrass along with the seeds the first year, and some of the suppliers include that in their seed mixes, but you don't want that grass to go to seed. So if you have annual rye and you let it grow up, it shades the little wildflower seedlings, it chokes out some of the undesirable plants, but you do have to mow it before it seeds or you're going to have ryegrass mix in with your prairie for quite a while. Um, the recommendations from a uh, wildflower farm are to keep uh, the patch mowed down to six inches and certainly no more than 12 inches during the first year. And they're assuming that you're planting predominantly perennials if you have a lot of annuals, then you're probably going to be mowing some of your annuals at the same time. Uh, the second year, the first mowing is right close to the ground early in the spring, and then keeping the plants down to about 12 inches thereafter, um, while again, the perennials are now beginning to show above ground and, and even to bloom. And there are any number of rather aggressive plants that you would like to keep out of your bed, and here's a list of some of them. Unfortunately, Dutch clover, which is uh, honeybees like a lot, is uh, considered overly competitive uh, with native wildflowers. And also try to keep a strip, if you're planting a large area, keep a strip mowed at the perimeter of the meadow to try and help keep out uh, plants that spread by rhizomes from invading into the perimeter and getting into the uh, wildflower prairie. If you're interested in planting wildflowers, whether it's a little bed in the garden or something larger, uh, again, the promoting pollinators on your place has lots of good advice. Applewood Seeds has a number of fact sheets and uh, Wildflower Farms has very extensive instructions for planting uh, wildflowers in a meadow or in a garden, large areas, small areas. Um, their manual is extremely thorough. And if you're interested in uh, getting a prairie meadow, uh, started on your property, I recommend that you have a look at that. Here's one of the issues that our plants have to deal with. We don't get a whole lot of rainfall, 15 to 16 inches a year, and much of it in our climate falls in the summer. So um, 
the plants will begin to see this moisture in, in March and April, and we do get um, two to three inches in summertime. And that's those thunder showers that roll in about three o'clock every afternoon. I moved here from around Portland. Here's the rainfall in Portland, just about the opposite. Portland actually gets less rain in the summer months than Cheyenne does, and they're in a the rainforest. However, they make up for it the rest of the year when they can get up to eight or nine inches on average during the winter time, which we certainly don't enjoy. But our plants need to be able to utilize that moisture and to survive when the moisture isn't available. Average temperatures, our lows on average get to be above freezing probably May through September or October. That doesn't mean you can't have a, a frost on a day or two or more in those months, but our months above freezing are only about half a year and the rest of the year, plants have to be able to tolerate freezing temperatures at night. And here's our snowfall. Although I think this year would probably change the graph a little bit considering what happened last week. Um, but nonetheless, we get snow for uh, seven months of the year. And that requires that places demands on plants. So when I started to uh, see what I could do to plant uh, for my honeybees, I first of all looked at some of the mixes that uh, companies promote for planting wildflowers. And I looked at the national companies like Eden Brothers or American Meadows. And then Catherine warned me that many of the plants that are in the national mixes are not gonna do very well in Wyoming for all of those reasons we've talked about. And that I really needed to look at some more uh, selected regional mixes of plants that would be uh, adapted to uh, the front range uh, conditions. And that got me connected to Applewood Seeds, although there are several seed suppliers. And Applewood makes a number of mixes. And I'm not gonna test you on these so you don't have to write them all down, but this is what they call their bee feed mix. And you'll see many uh, familiar plants in here. There are poppies, uh, coreopsis, some asters, coneflowers, um, Siberian wallflower, which is not a native, but is a common plant to see in, in these uh, wildflower mixes as a nectar producing plant. Uh, some mints, bergamot is in the mint family um, and uh, some other native plants. So there are usually, oh, maybe uh, two dozen uh, different plants to try to make sure that there will be bloom in at least three seasons, spring, summer, and fall. Um, this is what they call their honeybee flower mix. It's a little bit different, but I think many of the same uh, familiar plants are here. Uh, poppies and asters, coreopsis, oh, the um, natives like Mexican hat and blanket flower, uh, prairie clover, uh, some more mints, and uh, so on, and, and odorous uh, aromatic flowers like basil and mignonette. And this is their specific high plains pollinator mix, which has a number of natives in it. And again, many of these are going to be familiar uh, plants, the coneflowers, coreopsis, penstemons, flax. Um, many of these are uh, seen uh, simply as garden, as garden plants uh, sold at the master gardener uh, sale in May. So we came up eventually with a custom mix. Um, and the custom mix was a compromise. I wanted to keep it fairly inexpensive. Some of the native perennial mixes are up to more than $100 a pound, uh, which was a little spendy for me. And that meant including some of the lower cost plants and some that are not, uh, not native. Um, so I used the, some of their mixes, the bee feed mix, the honeybee mix, the Rocky or the High Plains pollinator mix, and also some uh, natives and some near natives and some non-native uh, plants uh, with the goal of creating a mix that would have uh, three seasons of bloom. And we've kind of tweaked this uh, each year. Uh, this year, uh, I bought uh, 70 pounds and I've already distributed 26 pounds to different folks who would like to uh, try it out. Um, they give us a wholesale price. Uh, it's $26 a pound and that is pure seed. Uh, you can go into the big box stores and I looked in there and I, oh, wildflower seed, a pound for $9.95. That looks terrific. Well, 
I read the label and it was uh, 6% seed and 94% filler. So that was mostly peat moss at uh, $10 a pound. <laughs> the actual seed cost was up about $65 a pound for uh, what you could pick up at the big box store. Um, so this is a little higher than it has been in past years, um, but uh, I think it's they're still offering us a very nice uh, bargain for uh, a locally adapted mix. So that's what I have to say about uh, planting wildflowers. The rest of this is a challenge to you guys, and here's how it's going to work. I'm going to show you a picture of a plant and see if you know what that plant is. And if you do, you're welcome to uh, type it in on the chat box or uh, unmute and tell us what you think it is. Um, I'll let you look at the picture and then I'll, in some cases, tell you a little something about it. So this is a perennial with a taproot that's in the Asteraceae family. Uh, these are also called compositae, and that means their flowers are composite flowers. What we call a flower is actually a number of small florets, which are bunched together to create the bloom, which we see as a single flower. Now, here's a hint. The serrated leaves of this plant are said to resemble the tooth of a lion, or dent de lion. And this is an important plant because it's one of the very earliest plants to bloom. Along with the spring blooming orchard trees and shrubs, um, this is the nectar and pollen plant that's available to uh, pollinators early on in the spring when they are beginning to wake up from the winter and need those resources to start raising brood and making more bees and wasps and flies. Um, you can actually get a honey made from this flower. It is bright yellow, it's very strong, and uh, it has an aftertaste that some people don't, don't like. It's thick and easily granulates, and granulation is considered by some people to be a negative quality in honey. They like their honey to stay liquid. It really is not that important. It's easy to ungranulate uh, honey just by warming it gently. Um, because this is an early spring uh, resource for the honeybee hives, uh, most people will leave that honey in the hive to let the bees use it to raise their young. Um, therefore, finding true monofloral honey from this flower is a little difficult, but it actually is available on, on the internet and you can buy uh, honey made from these blooms. You can also use the leaves as an edible for salads. The blossoms can be used to flavor tea or to make wine. And you can even roast that big taproot and make a coffee substitute out of it. So I'm not sure why so many people are trying to exterminate this, this flower from their, their property. Uh, my dad used to walk around with a little thing that looked like a pogo stick that was full of herbicide, and he would individually spray the plants to try to get rid of them, uh, taking a great deal of time and trouble to do that. And at the same time, he was planting daffodil bulbs, which create a nice bright yellow bloom in the spring. That doesn't make much sense to me. I think we should be supportive of this plant and not be trying to get rid of it. Our lawns don't have to look like cutting greens. Um, and it's a lovely uh, plant and the seeds, uh, when the seed heads form, will keep your kids occupied for quite a long time in plucking those uh, clocks or blow balls or fuzz balls and uh, blowing, distributing and blowing the seed around. So I hope everybody knows what this plant is. Dandelion. I was surprised at how many different species of dandelion there are, but I hope um, people will not be busy exterminating this plant off their, their land because it is a very helpful resource for honeybees and, and other bees as well. So that's the pattern that we're going to go through. And I'll give you the first challenge here. This is an annual. It's quite quite showy, rather spectacular. Very tall uh, bracts that are covered with uh, blooms in uh, white, pink to purple. Here's a picture of one of those bracts and you can see the blooms are opening. They're opening from below and then gradually working their way up toward the top of the uh, inflorescence there. Anybody, have, if you know what this is, go ahead and, and type your answer in on the chat or, Let's see how many people recognize this one. There it is. And here. Okay, a little information about that. 
Uh, I'm showing you the purple varieties. There are yellow varieties, and the yellow varieties are said to be even more tolerant of uh, drought and alkaline soils. And here's a hint, if you're in the scientific nomenclature, the genus name begins with the letter C. That might help some of you. This is a significant nectar plant. Uh, it is said that uh, in places in which there are large uh, tracts of bloom, it will uh, add 100 pounds of honey to a colony in just 10 days, or fill two to three medium supers, which is about 80 to 120 pounds of honey in just three weeks. Unfortunately, the honey is said to be, and I can't say that I've tasted monofloral honey from this one, greenish white and with an unpleasant flavor that is said to improve with age. Well, maybe people just get used to it if they've got uh, 100 pounds of it from uh, a large uh, a large tract. Uh, this is also an important plant for native bees. It supports monarch butterflies and even hummingbirds will go for those spires. So do you think you know what it is? Rocky Mountain bee plant, which is Cleom cerulata. Um, a long blooming native annual, large showy flowers, uh, attracts butterflies. A lot of the things that I like to see, easy to grow. I like that one. A fragrant flowers and foliage. Uh, what's not to like there? And bee friendly and attracts butterflies. Has anyone uh, had any specific experience in growing Rocky Mountain bee plant or have any hints to uh, share on how to keep this, uh, uh, how to germinate it and how to keep it going in your garden? I have some growing right now for the master gardener sale. Ah, oh, terrific. Okay, well, if you want to try it out, you know where to get some. Did you do anything special to get the seed? To germinate? I ordered the seeds and I planted them and have them under grow lights. Ah, with, okay. You know, did that you, type uh, of thing. Did you freeze and thaw and freeze and thaw them or not? I did not. I didn't know that these needed to be um, that have that done to it, but they've popped up. So That's I great. guess I lucked out. <laughs> okay. And and you know, some of the seeds improve their germination when you do that, but it may not be absolutely required. Um, is, I would it, suggest... is it still early enough in the season that we could put some out at this point and it would stratify them just naturally? I believe we're going to have nighttime freezing temperatures through probably mid-May or so, maybe later, depending on uh, the, the weather this year. So I would imagine, although it uh, would have been easier earlier in the spring, I think you probably still have that chance. The alternative would be to put them in and out of the freezer and refrigerator and freezer and refrigerator for- I'll forget, so it's easier to put them outside. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank it's you. It's easier to do it outside. Well, thank you. We'll look for those at the gardener sale. All right, here's one that I always like to see easy to grow. That, that's a, a nice label for anything I'm gonna try. And that's because I don't have a very great green thumb. This one I think folks will recognize uh, driving from Cheyenne up toward uh, um, the, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of Warrington. Uh, often in the spring, I think you see this on the hillside and you see this yellow and reddish uh, color on what otherwise is a green to brown, brown hillside. And in, I think uh, two years ago in spring, uh, these were very, very common along that area. It's a perennial, it is drought resistant, has pretty reasonable sugar concentration and is said to make a good quality dark honey. And it's a food source for caterpillars. There even is a moth that has evolved to have wings that look very much like these petals, um, and which uh, uh, for which this serves as a food source for the caterpillars. And if the seed for this one does not require uh, stratification. And that's uh, Bellardia, Bellardia aristata. That's the blanket flower. Um, Long-lasting perennial, attractive to butterflies. I like to see the deer and rabbit resistant because I've got deer and antelope that are coming right in the yard and they'll come in the high tunnel if I accidentally leave the door open. Uh, I had some uh, raised beds that I built over the winter that haven't got any dirt in them yet and they're just sitting around and uh, the mule deer are standing by the raised beds just waiting to see what's going to come up in them even though they haven't been planted yet. So uh, deer and rabbit resistant is a good thing. I haven't ever tried this for cut flowers, but that's an interesting idea. 
All right, this one I think most people will know. Um, it has a, a, not terribly short, but relatively speaking, a short uh, period of bloom in the spring. You often see this kind of light blue sky blue color out in the fields in the springtime. Um, and it has a rather fern-like delicate uh, set, of, set of leaves. Um, it also is, uh, it's a nectar producer, not especially uh, a bee plant, but often included in mixes because it's very dependable. Any guesses? All right, that one is called wild flax or Lewis flax because as everyone knows, wild and Lewis are practically synonymous. Uh, it, uh, it dependably pops up in the spring and, and reseeds. Uh, heat tolerant, uh, thrives in lean dryish soil. That all sounds very good to me. And I've had good luck with this as a part of wildflower mixes. It has come back a couple of years uh, running without reseeding. All right, here is the scarlet version of flax. It's a different uh, species in the same genus. I haven't had as much luck getting this to come up as the light blue. Has anyone tried growing scarlet flax? I'd love to have both of them going in the yard, so I keep uh, trying. Uh, but it hasn't seemed to be as robust as the Lewis flax is. All right, this one I bet everybody knows. It's probably in your garden already. This is a uh, purple spiral, uh, a spike of uh, purple blossoms on uh, a narrow single stem. It's a perennial, drought tolerant, very widely adapted. As I recall, there are about 60 species of this in different parts of Wyoming. Uh, you can get hummingbirds to come to the red, red variety. Uh, it's a food source for the caterpillars, and it has a fairly high uh, sugar content in its nectar. And I won't ask people to guess that because I think everybody knows that's penstemon. That one happens to be penstemon strictus, the Rocky Mountain penstemon. Um, and uh, very drought tolerant, it says here, which is another good thing, particularly if you're trying to plant outside of your garden in, in your yard or your meadow. Now, I bet everybody knows what that one is. I like to see the deer and rabbit resistance. This one probably will not do as well out in the middle of the sunny field. A little, uh, prefers a little more moisture and shade. That's our blue columbine. There is a native columbine. This is Aquilegia cerulea. Cerulean refers to the color of the sky. So it's the light blue variety, but there are cultivars of the columbine that come in a whole variety of colors. And again, lots of features that I like to see. Fragrant flower, deer and rabbit resistance, attracts hummingbirds, good for cut flowers, just a general Good all-purpose plant if you have a slightly shaded or a little more moist uh, area in which to grow them. How many folks have uh, columbines in their gardens right right now? <laughs> Ours seem to come back uh, on their own year after year. We haven't uh, had to particularly divide them or replant them. They're in a corner of the garden and they are pretty dependable. All right, this one is a fall bloomer. And it has a rather characteristic appearance. It's another composite flower. So there are multiple florets making up each of those blooms. Um, I have uh, some of uh, not necessarily this specific variety, but one that's growing right outside my deck in my yard and has uh, come back uh, year after year. Plants that bloom in the fall are particularly helpful for uh, pollinators because these are storing uh, nectar and pollen to be able to overwinter. And often there is not a lot of bloom in the fall. There are a relatively small number of plants which are still blooming. A uh, single frost may end the bloom for many plants that bloomed in the summer. So fall blooming plants are of particular significance to help pollinators get through the winter. And uh, this one has a reasonable sugar concentration. Bumblebees will uh, collect uh, nectar and pollen 
and it's a host plant for caterpillars and even can support the migrating uh, monarchs. So this is an aster. This one happens to be the New England aster, uh, Symphotrichum novae angulae, um, and uh, may require a little bit more moisture, uh, but basically uh, in trying to achieve three season bloom, we're gonna be looking to asters and some of the other fall blooming plants to give us that late, uh, late season nectar and pollen production. This one is a native plant that fixes nitrogen, so it improves your soil. And that's a pretty good hint as to what we're looking at here. We have these little, I think they look like dusters. Uh, the flowers are cylindrical, uh, they're born on a single uh, stalk. Um, this is nitrogen fixing, it's a perennial tolerance for dry sites and very, very attractive to honeybees. It is said that uh, you can get yields in excess of 100 pounds per colony in areas in which uh, this is the predominant uh, plant. And it supports a whole variety of native uh, pollinators as well. Xerxes Society says this one is a must have in pollinator conservation efforts in those places where it is native and appropriate to the site which includes for us a whole lot of Wyoming, Nebraska, Colorado. So the nitrogen fixing tells you that this is in the family of clover. Uh, this is not the same genus as the Dutch clovers or the red clover, uh, which are actually considered to be aggressive and invasive and many uh, native uh, prairie mixes will avoid uh, using those. But the white uh, prairie clover and its cousin, the purple clover, uh, Dahlia candida. Candida refers to the white color. Uh, there's also a yeast that can cause thrush in your throat, which leaves a little white uh, appearance uh, to the lining of the throat. And that's candida as well. So Dahlia is the genus. And this is the native clover. Um, and uh, it fixes nitrogen in the soil, which is assistant uh, assists other plants to grow as well. So this is one that you definitely would want to include in uh, wildflower planting mixes. I think most everybody probably recognizes this plant and many, many folks are gonna have this or one of the cultivars of uh, this growing, growing in the garden. It's a perennial, it blooms during the summer. Particularly, uh, it is attractive to a whole variety of pollinators. And that's the purple coneflower, Echinacea. People grow it because of the medicinal quality of its roots. I'm told that the purple coneflower of all the coneflowers is the one that least requires the uh, moist uh, stratification. Um, this one is a little easier to grow than some of its cousins in the coneflower family. Uh, and therefore it's a little more common. Uh, I believe that there is a cultivar uh, the plant select came up with that's the Cheyenne spirit, which is uh, selected for color and dependable bloom. Uh, that is in the Echinacea family as well. That one, I think most everybody's gonna know. We've certainly got some of this growing around on, on our place. Uh, the bright yellow flower with the uh, dark, dark center. Widely adapted. Actually not a great nectar producer, but it is attractive to butterflies and does not require pretreatment. So fairly easy to grow from seed. You'll see it in a fair number of, uh, of seed mixes. It's a, uh, you could probably put together an album of songs written about flowers, like the Yellow Rose of Texas or uh, Edelweiss from uh, The Sound of Music, but there's actually a popular song about this flower. It was written by Laura Nairo, and I, it'll, give, it'll give it away, but uh, it says, uh, lazy flower, my, you've grown so tall. I have lost and loved him. You have seen it all, and goes on to Address the flower growing on the hillside, courted and cradled by heaven and hillside, sun-fried, black-eyed Sioux. And that is what this is. This is the black-eyed Susan, Rudebeckia hirta. 
And it's again, a tough plant that can survive in drought and adds a good deal of color uh, to, the, to the meadow. All right, we've already seen one variety of this plant. This is the fall bloomer with that rather characteristic uh, flower. The uh, one that we looked at was the New England, that was some phytrichum. This is the prairie aster. It's still in the aster family, but it's a different genus. This is Macaranthera tanacetifolia, uh, also called the Dakota daisy. Grows when well-drained soil, blooms from summer into fall, and attracts pollinators, full sun or partial shade, and can tolerate dryness. I like to have some asters in the mix, again, for that important fall, fall bloom. I think everybody knows this one. Popular name is a reference to the fact that somebody thought it looked like a sombrero, the bloom with that uh, central, uh, the, the uh, droopy uh, bracts around, around the central uh, portion of the bloom. And that's Mexican hat, also called prairie cone flower, and that's Rotibida columnifera. Uh, many of the same qualities that, uh, there we are. Low maintenance. I haven't used it for cut flowers, but I don't see why you couldn't. Resistant to deer, attractive to butterflies. Here's a plant that needs a little more moisture than is typical in a sunny meadow in Wyoming. And there's the bloom itself. But it is often included in these mixes as a color spot. That's the blue corn flower, Centuria cyanus. If you're a painter, you know that cyan is one of the shades of blue, uh, blue pigment. Um, the, but this may need a little bit more moisture or a slightly shady corner as opposed to being uh, planted out in the meadow itself. All right, drought resistant perennial, you recognize the, the shape of the flower. We've already seen one of these. This one is a little more cold hardy than the purple cone flower that we looked at uh, earlier. The seed does require stratification and it is a little slower to germinate. Uh, but it is also has the same uh, pollinator attractive qualities. This one is the pale purple coneflower, Echinacea pallida. I remember when we had a speaker from uh, one of the native wildflower nurseries uh, mentioned that he thought for Wyoming, the pale purple coneflower was probably a little better adapted than the more common purple coneflower. This one is a bee magnet. If you plant this, you will have lots, you will have noise in your garden of the humming of the bees as they approach it. It's a little hard to see on this picture, but the leaves are kind of grayish green and have a, a slightly uh, hairy or velvety feel. And if you felt the stems of this, the stems would feel square rather than round, which is a very good hint as to the family of plants that this is a member of. It's a member of the mint family. Easy to start from seed, doesn't require pretreatment. Magnificent honey plant, 500 pounds per acre. My goodness, I certainly want to have some of that growing around my, uh, my yard. Uh, and can also be a food source uh, for uh, caterpillars, moths, and hummingbirds. And that's uh, bergamot or bee balm. It's monarda. This one is monarda fistulosa. Uh, bergamot is the flavoring of Earl Grey tea. Earl Grey tea is a black tea flavored with mint, and the mint flavoring is bergamot. So if you have some growing, you can try making your own Earl Grey mix out of it. Um, and it will tolerate fairly dry conditions, although additional moisture can help the mints um, get along during the hotter days of the summer. Oh, let's see. Okay, we're going backwards, not forwards. Here we go. All right. Deer and rabbit resistance, bright bloom. 
You've seen its cousin, I think, already a little bit earlier. This comes in both annual and perennial varieties, does not require a pretreatment of the seed, and will make a dark amber honey if you have enough of it to have a monofloral uh, honey. We saw the Gallardia, uh, the blanket flower. This is its nephew or cousin, uh, Gallardia pulchella, which is Indian blanket and is very common in native wildflower uh, seed mixing. Extremely easy to grow, attractive to pollinators, and less than uh, two feet tall. I am particularly fond of this plant, although I guess it's not, uh, a, this one is not a native uh, to Wyoming. It bears these uh, flowers with this kind of spidery uh, appearance on branching stems. And we had this in our bee mix start that we uh, tilled and drilled into a couple of acres three years ago. And this was alive with bees. You could hear the bees coming around these plants if from the road. Uh, the whole meadow was simply humming with activity. It's a bee magnet, relatively easy to grow from seed, although a little hydration of the seed may help. It produces abundant nectar and actually has been planted in Europe as a bee plant. Not, it hasn't caught on quite as much in, in the US. Um, one, one, one caution is that if you have a pretty good stand of strawberries, uh, this plant attracts a pest of the strawberry plant, the ligus bug. And so it's suggested that it be kept away from commercial uh, strawberry uh, operations. This is Lacey Facilia, uh, Facilia tanacetifolia, also called scorpion weed. And I'm really fond of it as a uh, pollinator plant. Um, I've included it in some of the mixes, even though it's not uh, a, not a native plant. Um, but I think it's terrific for uh, attracting and feeding the bees. All right, you're pretty sure you know what this one is by now. It's just uh, one of the other varieties of these fall blooming plants with the uh, daisy-like composite flower. Uh, this is another aster. This one is Bigelow's aster. This is in the Macaranthera uh, genus um, and uh, prefers shallow or rocky soils and very drought tolerant. And that makes it popular with us. Excellent for pollinator conservation because of its late season bloom. And here's another cousin. You've already seen the example of uh, this one. Drought resistant, requires cold moist stratification, but once established, uh, will stick around for quite a while. Uh, it even attracts monarchs. Pollen search for honeybees. This is another Echinacea. This is the narrow leafed purple cone flower, Augustifolia. Um, and I think again, the, these varieties that are not the purple cone flower do require a little more attention to get them to germinate. Here's a spring blooming plant. And here's a close up of those flowers. Unfortunately, uh, this one is a little more adapted to lower elevations than we have here. I still see it in some of the, uh, some of the mixes. It's probably because it's relatively low cost. It's an annual, will grow in dry and sandy soil. And that's the, another Facilia. Uh, but not the Facilia tanacetifolia. This is Facilia campanularia. Uh, campanularia refers to uh, Campanile as a bell tower. So that refers to the bell like shape of the flower. This is the desert bluebell. In late summer, bright yellow blooms. It's a perennial, but not terribly long lasting season to season. And doesn't produce a lot of nectar, so it is actually a little more attractive to butterflies than bees. And that's the brown-eyed Susan. 
This is also Rudbeckia, but not Rudbeckia herta. This is Rudbeckia triloba. Blooms a little bit later in the summer, but with a very similar appearance to the black-eyed Susan. This one is in the mint family. Here's a close up of that bloom. And like many mints and other aromatic plants, very attractive to honeybees. This is bee balm, spotted bee balm. We uh, saw a different uh, species of Monarda a little earlier. This is Monarda punctata. And it uh, is an excellent bee plant. Blooming in spring and summer. And again, this one will be familiar to many folks who may have it growing in their garden. Another penstemon. This is the narrow leaved penstemon. It's a perennial, tolerates dry conditions. This one is not a native, but it has naturalized and it blooms in the spring. And if planted in mass plantives, it makes a quite a dramatic uh, show. Does anyone recognize this plant? Corn puppy in the genus Papaver, Papaver roeus, native to Europe. Um, but boy, when planted in these massive drifts, uh, if it blooms in the spring, it is really quite spectacular. It says that uh, state highway departments throughout the nation are planting red corn poppy along the roadsides. Okay, I think everybody can probably guess the, the, that we're working in at least the family of the asters. That particular one is Nemophila known as baby blue eyes, um, is it's a low growing plant. So used somewhat as a ground cover and has a relatively early bloom in spring, uh, which again is desirable because that's when we want to have plenty of resources available to the, uh, to the hive. Here's a long blooming plant. You've seen this same and uh, same plant in a different color. A little bit earlier. It's a nitrogen fixing plant. Perennial, very good nectar production. This is the purple version of the prairie clover, Dahlia. We saw Dahlia candida a little earlier. This is Dahlia purpura. Um, and uh, um, it was mentioned that the uh, white prairie clover is really a, an essential component of. Uh, prairie ecology, and the same could be said for this species of, of prairie clover as well. So we take a little break. I got a few more uh, slides on a different slide set, but um, does anyone have questions about uh, the plants that we've seen so far? And everyone, you can go ahead and unmute if you'd like. You join in. I have questions. I have put in the chat box David's email address. So if you want to get on his seed, uh, his seed list, his pollinator seed mix list, you can go ahead and email him and ask for that. Program is being recorded and it will be archived probably sometime next week. And it'll be archived. I'll put it in at least two places. One, it'll be on the uh, University of Wyoming Laramie County Extensions website, and then I'll also pass it off to Laramie County Master Gardeners to post it on their website. And Leah, I'm not sure if you've got a website or not, but I'll certainly pass it on to you so you can post it on, on um, whatever media you use. So this program tonight will be available to everybody who's here and wants to go back to it. Um, Catherine, we do have a website. I'll get with you because I think this is, I'm not, I'm going to put my mute back on. I think I'm going to kill everything. Yeah, Leah, it sounded like you had two different um, 
computer Zoom programs going and you're getting there feedback from it. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. Um, you know, as you grow these beautiful flowers from year to year to year, how what is a good way to maintain that they you know can continue to be um, large and beautiful. I mean, do you need to thin them out? Do you just kind of let them do whatever they like to do? What do you recommend? I think the, the ultimate goal, if you're uh, trying to plant a meadow or a bed of, of uh, flowers is to have a virtually low maintenance uh, planting. And many of these flowers uh, are not going to uh, spread so heavily that they have to be divided uh, frequently. They're basically adapted to rather stringent and harsh conditions. Now, that might be different if you were planting them as specimen plants in, you know, very fertile soil. These plants don't require uh, fertilization for the most part. They are used to extracting nutrients from our rather uh, gravelly and sandy soils. Um, but if you were growing them in excellent garden soil, then yes, they might uh, Get, get big and they might uh, uh, spread to the point where you wanted to, to thin them uh, somewhat. But I think the overall goal for most folks who are planting native wildflowers is to try to come up with a low or no maintenance uh, bed that doesn't require extra water, uh, doesn't require uh, much in the way of care. And again, the, the chief, our chief problem is that since the native prairie was here hundreds of years ago, a number of new plants have been introduced, some of which are overly competitive or overly aggressive with the, the native plants. So even if we were able to reestablish the prairie as it was before uh, the Europeans uh, came, it's hard to maintain because of the presence of such things as cheatgrass and thistles and brome grass, um, which are uh, in our neighborhood and will certainly try to get into our, our prairie beds. So our problem is not so much having to thin or fertilize or even water uh, these plantings, it's to try and control and keep out the aggressive introduced plants that are likely to take over if allowed to go. And for that reason, sometimes people will do things like um, they will till under a portion of the wildflower planting every year. Kind of the same strategy that some people use with strawberries where you may till under your strawberry, every other strawberry row, and then allow those rows to fill in by um, runners so that you have fresh plants every, every year, but you don't till under your whole strawberry bed because that will set back your production. Um, so some people will till uh, portions of their wildflower planting um, and then perhaps reseed uh, into those into those areas um, again as a way of refreshing the planting and also keeping out some of the undesirable plants. Thank you, appreciate it. I have a question. Sure. Um, I have a front yard that has only three and a half inches of topsoil above porous rock, and the soil analysis that it's sandy loam. And I'm wondering if this is an area that I could set up for wildflowers uh, and about how, what kind of soil would I, should I bring in or not bring any in with just three and a half inches? Um, I, it's not, you know, there's nothing to tell. So right. what, what okay. we have right now is some, uh, cheap fescue that this was a neglected lawn I had been pulling the weeds and it's really kind of has almost no weeds and it has some neglect, neglected cheap fescue and so I'm thinking of putting it into a xeriscape but I'm wondering what you might suggest for wildflowers in that area. I don't know that the shallow topsoil is going to be a particular handicap uh, in some of the planting manuals that uh, are, are on those websites, there are pictures of the roots of, of these plants. And many of these have substantial tap roots. They go down into the ground to try to collect water and nutrients. And that's how they can manage in very harsh conditions. 
Now, if you have a uh, fescue or something else growing there, your initial problem will probably be to get rid of it. And if it's a relatively small patch, you could potentially do that solarization process with the plastic uh, sheeting, um, but it requires perhaps even a season uh, to try to get rid of the, uh, the seeds and the, the plants that are already there. I would not think that just having shallow topsoil is necessarily a bad thing. These are the kind of plants that, that may very well be able to uh, survive and thrive in that. You might want to mulch uh, your seeding once you, once you have gotten rid of the existing plants. Um, you might want to apply a, a thin layer of mulch at the time that you seed, and that will add slightly to the, the topsoil that you, you have. The mulch well, but once these plants get established, I would think that they might do very well. They tolerate sandy and gravelly soils. Um, there are some that need a little more moisture than others, and I've tried to mention that uh, as we go. Uh, but it sounds to me like that might be uh, these plants might be very well adapted to what you have in in the yard without your having to import several inches of topsoil as you might if you were trying to plant a more traditional. Uh, garden of specimen uh, uh, plants. So as far as a mulch go, um, could you use a wood mulch? You want to avoid mulches that might have uh, weed seeds in them. Uh, and that pretty much rules out straw and hay unless you can get something like salt marsh hay that doesn't carry, uh, carry seeds along. Um, the, uh, depending, the, the uh, problem with bark might be how coarse your mulch is. Uh, the little wildflower seedlings initially are, are fairly delicate. Uh, so you probably wouldn't want to have a large chunky uh, uh, mulch. Catherine, you've mulched some wildflower plantings. What did you uh, use? Well, I've used, I, I try to use something that's fairly fine so that it, the seedling can push up through it. So I've used straw to do that with and, and of course you know I have an advantage in that I raise livestock and so I use straw as a bedding and so I have a lot of clean straw so I will use that as my mulch. That works out really well. Sometimes I'll get oat seeds or wheat seeds that germinate and grow and I, I just don't worry about those. That's just not a big problem. But if you can get straw that's that's kind of one of my favorite things or grass clippings that works out well. Um, leaves that you've kind of crunched up a little bit, those work out well. Pine needles are amazing. Skip the meth that they make the soil more acidic. You know, in Wyoming, we want our soil a little more acidic. So that's just meth. And, and so that's kind of what I use for mulching. And then, and then David, some questions here for you. Um, does liathrus or lupin grow well here? And are those worthwhile for pollinators? How about false indigo? Uh, I'm not familiar with false indigo, but as far as uh, liatris and lupin, stay tuned. <laughs> I haven't quite finished the pictures yet. <laughs> I have a couple of examples of those coming up. Yeah, so I can, great. So on the false indigo, it, it is a palm, bigger, your bigger ones that can get in there and open up that little flower. Very cool. Certain plants have very uh, deep trumpet-like blooms and uh, honeybees for the most part have rather short tongues. Uh, so there are some flowers that are um, available to native pollinators and bumblebees that are not as attractive to honeybees simply because the honeybees can't quite reach the nectar. Although they have been known to do a hole in the bottom of the neck of the trumpet in order to get at the nectar, even though they can't reach it from outside the flower. Well, if everyone's okay with that, we'll go ahead and look at a few more uh, plants here. Hopefully your eyes haven't glazed over quite yet. And since we were asking about this one, here's a plant that has a very dramatic uh, bloom in the summer. Uh, the interesting thing about these is that they start blooming at the top of this cylindrical uh, inflorescence and then gradually uh, the blooms work their way down uh, from the top, which means that they maintain their bloom over a long period of time. 
Now, this is quite a dramatic uh, plant uh, for a border or uh, in the garden as well as in the meadow. Uh, very attractive to monarch butterflies, particularly one of the species of this, Liguli stylus. Unfortunately, <laughs> these also attract rabbits, deer, and these grow from a corm. Their root is a corm, which is attractive to voles, which are uh, digging in the soil. Um, so unfortunately, these are not deer and rabbit resistant. They're actually attractive to deer and rabbit, but um, they will tolerate poor soils. They are drought tolerant, but they actually do better with a little more moisture. And like many of these seeds, they require that cold moist stratification to germinate. And that's the liatris that you're asking about. This is one of them, the gay feather or uh, blazing star. This is liatris spicata. Um, and I think those are just terrific, uh, terrific plants for any garden, regardless of their attractiveness to pollinators. Uh, that's a beautiful, striking plant. This one, I think everybody's gonna know, uh, it has kind of gray green uh, velvety foliage uh, and these pink blooms. And then in, uh, later on in the summer, it will produce seed. The seeds to my eye look a lot like dandelion seeds and they are born in profusion. If you have a whole field of this plant growing nearby, there are certain times of year when it looks like it has been snowing in the summer. There will be drifts of white around the uh, field, uh, which are actually these uh, prolific production of seeds that are, are airborne and will form uh, drifts on the ground, uh, very striking. This is summer bloom for monarchs. Many people are interested in planting uh, these now. They are also attractive to other uh, pollinators with a fairly good sugar concentration in the nectar. Reportedly make a uh, pale honey with a delicate mild flavor, which sounds very nice. And they improve the honey yields of honeybee colonies nearby. These need to have the cold moist stratification, but once established, they do spread by rhizomes as well as by seed which helps them to uh, establish themselves in an area. A uh, American poet was inspired by the uh, prodigious production of seeds by these plants. This is the common milkweed or Asclepius. This is Asclepius syriaca. Um, there are concentrated efforts being made now to plant milkweeds, try to encourage people to plant milkweeds in order to support the migrating monarch butterfly populations. Uh, the, the natural occurrence of milkweeds has been in great decline, uh, again, partially because of cultivation of property, the uh, lack of natural wildscapes, but also because of the use of herbicides like Roundup uh, have really reduced the number of uh, milkweeds uh, compared to their population some 40, 50 years ago. And so there is a real effort being made to encourage folks to plant milkweeds um, and, and support the monarch, the migrating monarchs. So Richard Wilbur is an American poet and he uh, wrote, this is a part of a poem called Two Voices in a Meadow. And he said, uh, a milkweed says, anonymous as cherubs over the crib of God, white seeds are floating out of my burst pod. What power had I before I learned to yield? Shatter me, great wind, I shall possess the field. Now, I like this uh, flower regardless of whether it's good for pollinators or not. Uh, it's a very cheerful, bright bloom. It's a member of the sunflower family. Uh, this particular one comes in shades of yellow, orange, and red, but there is another um, species that has a wider variety of white, blue, pale purple, coral uh, colored blooms. So I include this in our uh, mixes. I guess that there actually is a native uh, bloom. This is a cultivar. This one is called Bright Lights. This is Sulfur Cosmos, Cosmos sulfurius. The uh, pastel colored uh, are from a different species, which is Cosmos bipinatus. And there are a whole number of now hybrids of Cosmos selected for different uh, colors. 
these flowers don't last long individually, but the uh, plants keep producing blooms. They have a lovely kind of light ferny uh, foliage, and they just produce a bright spot wherever they are in the landscape, um, whether that's in the meadow or in a, a container or in the garden. Um, I'm very fond of Cosmos. Um, you've seen a variety of this before. Deer resistant, easy to grow, blooms in the summertime. Bright red and yellow flowers. Sometimes in the spring or summer, we'll see them on the hillsides. Attractive to native bees and flies, but not quite so much to uh, honeybees or bumblebees. And uh, because they are easy to establish, low cost, they often get included into wildflower mixes. They don't require pretreatment of seed. This is the tick seed or coreopsis. This one is the plain coreopsis. Um, I think we have a couple of these growing in the garden that we got at the Master Gardener sale and planted as specimen plants. Uh, but I've also put it into our uh, seeding mixes to add a little extra color into the meadows. This is a fall bloom, and the color may give you a hint as to what this is. Here's a little closer view of all the individual flowers on that stalk. Late season pollinator plant, reports monarch butterfly migration, uh, reported gains of 50 to 80 pounds of honey, makes a thick, pungent, dark honey. I have to say that um, there is a prejudice against darker honeys. The uh, popular honeys tend to be very light colored, very clear, not cloudy, have a very light flavor. I think that's too bad because many of the more interesting honeys are heavier, darker, uh, more pungent. Um, and uh, those kind of had a bad reputation in terms of the judging of honey in the honey contests. But I think they're actually much more interesting uh, as comestibles, then uh, the typical sort of very light uh, clover honey would be the typical light honey. Um, it is complaint that honey that is quick to granulate will harden, and that's considered to be a negative quality, uh, but it really isn't that important whether your honey granulates or not. It's very easy to restore its liquid quality, and it would be a shame if some of these uh, interesting dark honeys kind of became uh, too unpopular uh, simply because they're not the standard product. This uh, plant also spreads by rhizomes. Now, interestingly enough, people won't plant this because they're afraid that it will cause allergies in the fall, pollen allergies. And that's partly because it has very obvious pollen. The pollen granules are large and they're sticky and people see them and think, this is what's causing my hay fever in uh, August and September. It's actually a different plant entirely, ragweed, that's primarily responsible for the airborne pollen. This heavy sticky pollen uh, is mostly uh, sticking to the legs of the insects as they uh, come to pollinate the plants. This is goldenrod. It's in the genus Solidago. This is Nemoralis. I have seen this listed as an undesirable plant in prairie, um, in prairie meadows, which I think is too bad because uh, fall, uh, fall po uh, pollen producers are, are actually uh, desirable, but I guess it can, because of its rhizomatous spread, it can actually uh, be uh, somewhat more aggressive and invasive than uh, other, native, other native flowers. Now here's a very nice one. Um, this has those uh, purple flower spikes. And um, if you were to feel the stem, you'd notice that this is another member of the mint family. There's the bloom itself, multiple small florets in a single inflorescence. Extremely attractive. Actually, in tests, honeybees would go to this plant before they would go to white clover. And white clover is uh, considered sort of a standard uh, plant for the attraction of, of bees. High concentration of sugar in the nectar was planted in the Midwest in massive plantings in the late 1800s. And it was claimed that a single acre of this would support 100 colonies of honeybees. That might be an exaggeration, but nonetheless, this is a terrific 
pea plant that makes a light minty flavored honey. This particular seed has to have light to germinate, so we don't want to bury it in the soil. Just press it in uh, to the surface and the seed does respond to cold moist stratification. This plant is not uh, drought tolerant as many of the mints are not. They may require some extra water support in our drier seasons or planting in part, in part shade. And this is the giant hyssop. It's Agastache urticifolia, um, also called horse mint. And these members of the mint family are just terrific pollinator plants. Um, it's, uh, I guess, three to four feet tall. So it stands out in the meadow. Um, and uh, I'm very interested in trying this, not just as a, as a part of uh, a mixed uh, flower mixture, but I'm going to try a little uh, mass mass planting bed of it somewhere on the property and see if it's uh, quite the bee plant that it's made out to be. Oops, sorry. Uh, let's see. Lost my. Okay, I'm screen sharing. Where's my? Where did it go? Sorry. Okay, we want to close that and get back to where we were. Now let's go down here. There we are. Sorry about that. All right, I think everybody's seen this one blooming around. I've, I recall I've seen it in the ditches along Round Top going down near the base and near the uh, horticultural station. There it is. The person who mows the uh, edges, the verges of the Round, round Top Road uh, tends to leave these alone. So they let them grow uh, there, even though some of the other uh, grass in the area is mowed down. Now, if you're planting plants in this family, you need to look for single petaled rather than double petaled varieties. And unfortunately, some people don't like the pollen that these plants can produce in fairly large quantities. And so they have bred pollenless varieties, but the honeybees and the native pollinators prefer the single petaled versions and they prefer the ones that make pollen to the ones that don't make pollen. A pretty high sugar content for the nectar. And once they get established, they will stick around for quite a number of seasons. There's another plant that needs some cold moist stratification. This is the prairie sunflower. The genus is Helianthus. This is Petiolaris. Uh, I think it's well worthwhile getting these uh, established because once uh, they're, they're growing, uh, they will come back year after year. This is not a native plant, uh, but I think it's a, a very uh, it's a very good addition to some of our uh, planting mixes. Um, it's the cousin of a plant that we already looked at. This oh I'm sorry this I'm sorry it's not this is uh, the Siberian wallflower. It's a European import, uh, fragrant orange flower. It's very adaptable, uh, probably a relatively inexpensive seed, so it finds its way into numerous commercial uh, seed mixes. Seems to be adaptable to many different uh, conditions of moisture. This one, I think many of us have this growing uh, in the garden or in the yard. It has these uh, umbels of multiple, uh, multiple flowers with this very light, ferny uh, foliage. It can be used as a cut flower. And that one is Achillea, it's the yarrow. Naturalized non-native. And someone was asking about this one. Uh, late spring, these very dramatic uh, bracts of flowers upright come in shades of white, uh, blue, purple, even pink. It produces a high quality pollen, but not a tremendous nectar producer. It is a host plant for many butterfly caterpillars. I've heard the concern that this may be poisonous to livestock, but I don't know how many of these plants your horse or cow would need to eat before they would suffer any ill effects. This plant uh, 
which is the silver lupin, actually responds not only to a cold moist stratification, but actually to scarification, rubbing the seed between two pieces of sandpaper to actually break the uh, seed coat in addition to doing the uh, cold treatments in order to help the, the seed to germinate. So that this one is the silver lupin, Lupinus argentus. There are so a number of other uh, lupin varieties. One of them that you may be familiar with is the Texas blue bonnet, which is a different variety of the same genus, Lupinus. Now this is the plant that we've seen uh, already seen one cousin of, and the fact that it's covered with butterflies in this picture is a little bit of a hint as to uh, the, the popular name. It's an orange uh, blossom. Here's a close up of it. Other narrow leaves. This is another Asclepius. This is butterfly uh, weed. Um, distinctive bright orange plant. Um, it is in the milkweed family. We already saw the common milkweed. Uh, that was uh, uh, also in the genus Asclepius. So this is a milkweed, um, but uh, a little bit different in its uh, growth uh, pattern and looks a little different with these uh, multiple bright orange flowers. It has many of the same qualities uh, of the uh, milkweed in terms of the uh, attraction of the pollinators and uh, monarch butterflies. Here's a bright yellow uh, flower from uh, spring and summer. And I think that we've also got a specimen plant of this in the garden, not merely in the, the wildflower mix. This is another tickweed, tick seed. This is the uh, lance-leaved uh, Coreopsis, Coreopsis uh, lanceolata. Um, I think we've had pretty good luck with our uh, couple of tick seed specimens that we got at the Master Gardeners and put into a perennial bed. Um, and they have survived a couple of, of winters. Um, we'll have to see how they're doing this spring when the snow melts. Okay, here's a showy plant for toward the end of summer. A little bit closer up. I think you can guess what family that's in. That's the Maximilian sunflower. That's one of the native uh, sunflowers. You can also grow the cultivars. Uh, there are a whole variety of large flowered sunflowers like Autumn Beauty. Uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other cultivars which come in a whole variety of yellow, uh, russet, brown, uh, even kind of purplish uh, hues on the, the large flowers. Maximilian sunflower makes a lot of small uh, yellow flowers, and that makes it very attractive uh, to the, the pollinating insects. Here's another of those spiky purple plants. You've already seen uh, one variety of this. It is in the mint family. We saw the giant hyssop. This is the lavender hyssop, just another species in that same genus. With many of the same qualities, it's an abundant nectar producer. Uh, very attractive mint uh, for both honeybees and native bees as well. This is a pollen supplier in fall. And I think we also have seen uh, one variety of this. This is another goldenrod. We were looking at the gray goldenrod. This is the showy goldenrod, uh, bright yellow blooms. Um, again, the uh, this is not the... Uh, plant that causes hay fever in the fall, but it does make uh, quite a bit of pollen. And that's one of the reasons why we like to have it uh, in, in the mix for fall uh, resources in the fall for the honeybee. And let's see, this is a perennial, all spikes of purple bloom. is another of the Liatris. We saw the gay feather. This is the prairie blazing star. Um, this is uh, a native uh, to uh, Wyoming and the Front Range. Um, and uh, as they mentioned, it uh, grows very nicely with some of the other native plants that we've already been 
been looking at here. And I think everyone knows what this one is. We've seen one of the varieties already. That's another lupin. This is the wild lupin, lupin perennius. And again, the uh, seeds will respond to uh, scarification as well as to cold moist stratification. Well, that's the end of my pictures. There were a couple of plants that are mentioned as wildflowers for pollinators that I didn't get uh, into the, the picture quiz. Uh, Rattlesnake master, Joe Pye weed, and a number of salvias. Um, salvias are sage, but they're not sage brush. Sage brush is Artemisia, and salvia is the genus of the uh, sage plants, silver sage, a whole variety of, and some of these are cultivars, and some are quite showy, and people grow them uh, in floral borders uh, without any uh, thought that they're supporting pollinators, but they are good pollinator plants as well. Uh, trees and shrubs, we haven't mentioned, but shrubs and trees can produce massive quantities of nectar and pollen. Um, and here are some of the uh, trees that are particularly appropriate for plantings for pollinators. And they include the um, tree fruits like apples and plums and, pear, uh, and pears. We get a lot of bee activity on our spirea in the late summer and fall. Uh, I know folks who have uh, had very good luck having bees around willows. Willows make a high quality pollen. Um, and they uh, have very productive hives if you're lucky enough to live along a creek or a watershed where the willows are uh, in bloom. There are also garden plants that uh, are attractive to bees, and many of these are the aromatic herbs. Uh, some of these are in the mint family, um, like uh, oregano and uh, thyme uh, and marjoram. These are all uh, members of the larger group of mints. Uh, uh, grown as a um, medicinal herb. Borage is especially attractive to bees. Uh, it supplies uh, some lipids, which are uh, pollens. Um, so if you are growing herbs in your garden, you're very likely uh, going to have some uh, activity from bees when they are in bloom. There are also pasture plants uh, for pollinators. Uh, the problem is that folks who are growing a pasture to harvest for uh, forage, for storage, tend to harvest the plants just before bloom when the nutritional uh, quality of the plant is at its highest. If the plants put their energy into uh, blooming, actually their nutritional value declines slightly. So unfortunately, even though you're across the road from someone who's got an acre or two of clover or alfalfa, they may be out there uh, harvesting it uh, before it comes fully into bloom and before your uh, bees or native pollinators have a chance to take advantage of it. Uh, but uh, if these plants are allowed to uh, go to bloom, if they're being grown, for example, as cover crops to be tilled under, um, they can be very supportive for uh, honeybee populations. And hopefully your front yard might look a little like that. So that's the end of what I have. Uh, any questions at this point? If you have any questions, go ahead and unmute and ask David or put them in the chat box and I can ask for, for you. I do have kind of a comment that came in and it was, do you worry about your straw having pesticides, herbicides that might kill the flowers? That seems to be a common concern so I avoid using it. So your straw is going to come from grain crops like wheat and oats. There are no herbicides listed for either one of those and they just they just aren't sprayed. Also farm there's just not enough money in oats and wheat is always questionable on 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 what it's going to bring in every year. So farmers don't spray their, their grain crops with herbicides. And then there was a question about and then pesticides, which I'm assuming you're thinking like insecticides. And so that's also very unusual to see 
wheat or oats, and oats are almost never sprayed with any sort of insecticide, but to use ladybugs to control things like the Russian wheat weevil. So very rare do you ever see um, any of those grain crops sprayed with, with any sort of pesticide. So I don't ever really worry a lot about that, but I did put in the chat box um, to get a hold of s and Organics in Hereford, Colorado. And, it, and again, I listed it all in the chat box. And Rebecca down there knows just about every organic farmer in Laramie County and Weld County. So there is just a whole wealth of, of people to go to. And you need to get a hold of them sooner than later because very few of them put up wheat straw or oat straw in anything other than big round bales. And so you got to get a hold of them now to put in a request for small squares. So I'm not seeing a lot of other questions coming in. That was so a from, fantastic so David presentation. From, thank you, Tasha. Oh, good. And David. Yeah, yeah I hope it inspires some folks to uh, either uh, plant a wildflower mix in a corner of the garden or at least try some of these uh, as uh, specimen plants in the garden because I think they'll be very rewarding uh, in terms of their uh, color uh, and their robustness. They may not require quite as much nursing and attention. Gardening is hard in Wyoming. Uh, beekeeping is hard in Wyoming. But I think some of these plants have the potential uh, to be very uh, nice additions to the garden and hopefully won't uh, require a whole lot of uh, watering uh, and attention in order to get them established and keep them going from year to year. David, I have a question. Do you sure. have different, are there different mixes for different microclimates in your, you talk about some need more, more moisture, some need more sun, or do you just broadcast them where you want them to grow and assume that the right ones will grow in the right microclimates around your property? Yes, there are a couple of ways to, uh, there are a couple of ways to plant. Uh, for smaller areas, there's a thing called shake and rake, <laughs> which is uh, to, and again, the preparation of the planting bed is probably the single most important key to success with these uh, flower plantings. If you simply rototill under uh, turf and weeds without exhausting the weed seed bank that's in the soil, when you plant your wildflowers, they may uh, look like they're doing pretty well the first year or so, but in the second year, you're going to start seeing these uh, introduced species taking over, and maybe by the third year, you're going to have a, a patch of, now many people consider wildflowers to be weeds. One definition of weed is a plant growing where you don't want it to, so if you're planting wildflowers, they're not weeds. And it's the other plants that are the weeds that are getting into your bed. Uh, but you can, uh, sh you can, in small areas, you can uh, rake the surface, uh, shake the seeds onto the soil and rake the surface a little bit and then perhaps mulch um, in order to get good soil contact on the seeds. And yes, what is going to grow will grow. Um, the mixes are, I think, quite a mixed bag. Some, clearly some of the national seed companies have put together a mix of common wildflowers that will have some chance of surviving in most of the areas in the country. Others have a more regionally adapted uh, mixes. And then you can get down to rather specific selected mixes. For example, like the, the Applewoods High Plains uh, pollinator mix um, has been obviously pretty carefully selected to provide mostly native, mostly perennial species that are likely to survive in a dry environment at high elevation. Now you could purchase a wildflower mix from one of the national companies and try it and some of what is in it will grow, but it's very possible that quite a bit of that is not, not likely to take in our, in our situation. The other way, if you're doing a larger area, is to actually uh, till the soil. And again, you may have to till repeatedly over one growing season to really exhaust the uh, existing seed bank and then to drill the seed and there are some instructions for how to do that on a couple of the websites that I've given you. Um, it is per perfectly possible to drill the seed just as you would uh, drill 
uh, seed for a commercial crop. Um, and that gets the seed into the soil. Uh, and hopefully uh, you could potentially do that in the fall, let the seed uh, undergo stratification over the winter, and hopefully uh, come spring, you would start to uh, see uh, some of the plants. And again, you might use a nurse a crop of an annual, uh, annual ryegrass as long as you don't let it go to seed. Okay, thank you. So it says, David, here's a question from Donna. Do you ever clean up the meadow after winter or just leave everything? Um, well, in general, once your meadow is established, you probably are not going to need to, uh, to mow it very much. But for the first year or two or even three, you may need to do some mowing in order to uh, reduce the competition with, with your wildflowers. And the thought is that the first year wildflower seeds are really primarily producing roots. They're not necessarily producing a lot of green growth on top of the soil. Um, now, some of the annuals may in fact uh, do well and, and pop up, but uh, for the most part, the perennials are not going to put on much of a show the first year, but that does give you the opportunity uh, to mow without necessarily um, harming or setting back the, um, the, the plants that you're trying to encourage. Second year, you would probably be mowing less frequently and you may not want to mow in the fall because the uh, plant material there serves as a catch for snow and prevents uh, and, and catches moisture, traps moisture, uh, which can be helpful um, over the long run uh, so often folks won't mow these in the fall, but very early in the spring, particularly if you've got some invasive grasses, a uh, cheat grass uh, actually germinates in the fall and pops up readily in the early spring. If you can uh, set those plants back before uh, your wildflowers have really started to uh, bloom, started to grow uh, in the spring, that's there is an opportunity there. Uh, for you to uh, use use mowing as a way to encourage the growth of your desirable plants by opening them up to more uh, sunlight and by setting back uh, the the undesirables. So what I do with mine, my pollinator meadow, if you can call it that, is I um, it's big enough. I send my husband in with a brush hog and have it mowed down, and that really seems to help it a lot. What time of year, Catherine? Oh, I'll send them in here. As soon as the snow's off the ground and the ground's not wet, I'll send them in. So I'd like to catch it sometime between the snowstorms. Okay. Have you had to reseed particularly on your meadow plot? Oh yeah, I have. Do you reseed and, a little each uh, year? You know, I, I do, I try to reseed as, as, as it calls for, but on my, because it's so big, you know, I've got 17 acres of pollinator habitat. On my wish list is a no-till drill, so I can go in there with a tractor and, and seed to my heart's content. <laughs> but yeah, reseeding is, you have to, it's just not, or environment here, it doesn't create a stable meadow. And, and so you, you will find yourself reseeding a lot. Uh, unfortunately, I, I wish it wasn't so, but like every third or fourth year I go in and reseed. Do you just overseed at that time? Yeah, I don't till. I don't till anything up. I don't plow it up. I don't, I, I, I try not to hurt the soil and what's already there anymore than I have to. And so a, a no-till drill has got a cutter in front of it. So it, it pushes open the soil and plants behind it. So it, it, it does a little furrow first for the seed to go into and then it closes it behind there. So not, not an inexpensive piece of equipment, but it's on my wish list. And my husband's looking for one. <laughs> so he tells me.
Any other questions, any other thoughts, comments? I will, um, I'll send this to my, this program tonight has been recorded and I will send it to my secretary, um, Joan, who will then do closed cap catching and do <laughs> some editing and, and kind of tighten it up a little bit. And then I'll forward the recording to, to Leah and she'll put it on your website. Again, it'll go on Laramie County Master Gardener website and Laramie County Extension website so that it's available to anyone and everyone who wants to view it. I also just sent to Leah a brochure on growing a wildflower garden and the seeding process that takes place. So if you look on your website, you should be able to find that brochure. And then I also put into the chat box David's email address. So if you want to buy pollinator seed mix from him, it'll be available. And again, he just does an amazing job at putting the, the mix together. And Applewood Seed Company is, has been around for, for a long, long time, what, 40 years or more. And so they're very reputable. They take a lot of care in what they sell. And so the mixes are going to be very appropriate for our area. And any other thoughts or questions? You can either unmute or just put it in chat, whatever works. I think that was pretty thorough. <laughs> Information well, overload. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. It was very beautiful well, with all those flowers. I hope that we'll be able to find some of these at the Master Gardener plant sale or elsewhere around. Um, maybe at the nurseries in Northern Colorado. Um, if you prefer to start from a plant rather than try to start from seed. I started some Echinacea purpurea and some uh, butterfly weed. They're coming up well, especially the butterfly. Was that with the milk jug? Uh, no, I just did cold stratification in my fridge. I just put uh -huh. it in a wet paper towel and left it in there for 30 days. And then I just sewed it a couple days ago on my heat mat and it has come up in two to three days, like faster than the tomatoes. So wow. yeah, okay. nice. pretty good results nice. so far. It's better than so the <laughs> Good to see you guys. Well, I'm not Thank seeing you. any more questions or comments. Again, um, both David and I are easy to get a hold of. Leah knows how to get a hold of us. So we're more than happy to help you with any of these aspects of a wildflower meadow or planting for your bees. So with that, David, again, thank you very much. As always, you're a very engaging and fun speaker to have. And so, thanks so with that. Thank you. Good night. Right. Good night, Good night. everybody.